Oh, you guys doing all right this morning? Good, good, good. Well, hey, as, as Pastor mentioned, we're coming to the end of our, our 21 days of prayer, this time that we've set aside to uh, really boost our prayer lives, really focus on seeking the Lord. And, and as we started this, Pastor had, uh, had made some little cards available where you could fill out like a time that you commit to praying every day during this time of prayer. How many of you guys filled out one of those cards? All right, raise your hands up nice and high. We all know everybody in here. If you smell funny, everybody already knows it. Okay, you can put your hand down. All right, uh, how have you guys, if you filled out a card, how have you guys prayed, prayed what you committed to at least 50% of the time? All right, that's good. All right, how have you guys uh, prayed at, uh, that much at least 80% of the time during those 21 days? All right, great, good. How have you guys came out uh, at some point yesterday during our day of prayer and spent some time here and praise and worship? Very good, very good, cool. And the thing is, as we go through this prayer time, you know, you notice the atmosphere today is a little bit different than usual. It's like we're kind of in a special place with God, and, and it's because we've been preparing ourselves for three weeks, and yesterday, spending all this extra time in prayer, it's like, you know, it's good when musicians can play an instrument. It's another thing if they tune the instrument first. You know, so it's like we're having a special service this morning because we spent extra time yesterday really fine-tuning the instrument so that we'd be ready to, to hear from God and be ready to move with Him. And, and really, that's what prayer does. And the point of this is that this 21 days of prayer is not just an event, but it's the beginning of something bigger. Amen? It's just, the, just we're just getting started with prayer. This was an opportunity for us to try something on that maybe we hadn't tried on before. Be like, okay, well, I'm going to commit to praying this much every day where I haven't prayed that much before. Or maybe it's just getting back to doing something that you haven't done in a while. Either way, in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, uh, Paul wrote, never stop praying. All right? So just because we're coming to the end of our 21 days does not mean that we're going to quit. Like, Whew, that's over. Now I don't have to pray anymore until next year when, when pastor says pray, you know. Anytime we have these things, it's because the Lord is trying to stir us up. It's like he's trying to get us to do something that we should be doing anyway, but we need to take some time to focus on that so that we, so we get in the groove of doing it more regularly. You know, it's like as, as couples, we need to date our spouses regularly, you know, because it's not, well, I dated my wife, and then we got married, and whoo, that's done. I'm done loving her. You know, now I just get to enjoy the rest of my life with her doing my cooking and cleaning and my laundry, right? That, just in case you're married, that doesn't work. Amen. All right. We have at least one amen from a woman. The rest of you ladies say, amen. that's a weak amen. All right, we have to work on this. But what happens is we focus on things. You take time to date your spouse and you go out for your anniversary because you need these special times to, to boost and to focus on things that you should be doing every day anyway, right? To l realize, oh yeah, we do appreciate other, each other. We do like being around each other and, and to grow in that. And when, when Paul says, never stop praying, and, and Jesus even, in Luke chapter 18, 1, it says, one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. So Jesus said the same thing. Don't quit praying. Don't give up on prayer. Don't give up on, on talking with the Lord. You know, Mom introduced it that first week about prayer is not just talking to God, but it's talking with God. So when Jesus is saying never give up praying and Paul is saying never stop praying, he's not just saying get up in the morning and then blab all day. Just get up and say, good morning, Lord. Thank you that this is a new day, and I'm just glad that you're alive and that I'm alive in you, and I'm just going to praise you and thank you and hallelujah and amen and thank you for my shower and for my towel and thank you for the water and thank you for my clothes and for my breakfast, and, and I don't have any time to talk to my wife because I'm too busy talking to the Lord all day. But that's, that's not how it works. He's not just saying just go on and on and on and babble all the time. What he's essentially saying is don't ghost God. You know what I mean when I say don't ghost God? Who, wave at me. If you're under 30, you probably know what that means. When you ghost somebody, it means you don't get back to them. You know, you text somebody and say, hey, what's going on? Crickets. You know, and then you say, hey, you, you want to get together tonight? Still nothing. Hey, uh, can I buy you dinner? Still nothing. All right, that's called ghosting. You don't, you know, they call them, they don't pick up. It's like their phone is dead. They are ghosting you. It's like they disappeared. They don't want to talk to you. And so what Paul's saying, what Jesus is saying is don't ghost God. All right, don't turn off on him. Keep the conversation going. You know, when, when I was a kid, uh, there's different times that we would have walkie-talkies. Anybody ever play with walkie-talkies as a kid? 
Well, Adam and I, different times, we had walkie-talkies. You'd be at Grandma's house. They'd have walkie-talkies. And so you play with walkie-talkies. We got a picture, I think, of some kids, you know, on walkie-talkies. And, you know, when I saw this picture, I said, that is not realistic. Because you know, if you've ever played on walkie-talkies, you cannot be that close to somebody else on a walkie-talkie. Because you push your button and you just hear a, this crazy squealing feedback noise and it's horrible. So you have to put distance between you so that you can enjoy the walkie-talkies. Well, then what happens is you look like the second kid. As you're out in the backyard, you're behind the tree, you're hanging out, and you're like, hey, what are you doing? And they're like, I'll have to go to the bathroom. Okay, we'll stay outside. And then you're going back and forth and like, you know, playing army or playing whatever. And inevitably what happens is one of the people gets distracted. You know, my brother would get distracted. He'd go in. He'd go to the bathroom. He'd set down his walkie-talkie. He'd go out in the kitchen and get an Oreo. Then he'd get distracted by what Abby was watching probably uh, on TV, which would be, uh, what was she always watching? Um, uh, Full House. I was thinking about the one with Zach. Zach and Saved by the Bell. Thank you. Have you guys watched Saved by the Bell? All right, honesty in church is good. All right, so, you know, he'd get distracted, and I'd be out there, be like, hey, what's going on? Nothing. Hey, what are you doing? Nothing. You know, and eventually I'd be like, what is going on? I'm thinking his battery died, and I come inside, and his battery didn't die. He just left his walkie-talkies hanging somewhere, and he got distracted and was doing something else. You know, he ghosted me, right? And so what, what he's saying here is essentially don't turn off your walkie-talkie, right? That living a life of prayer is about living a life where we're staying in contact with God, that we're not shutting down that conversation. You know, if you have that text chain on your phone where you've been talking to your buddy, you know, you don't just delete the whole text chain because you might want to go back and see what time they said to meet you at the restaurant or find that, uh, you know, embarrassing picture of you that they took and that they sent you like three weeks ago, you know, and if you can scroll back through the text chain, you can find that stuff. So you don't delete it when, you're, when you have a relationship with somebody. So it's the same way with God. Just because we're done with our 21 days of prayer doesn't mean that we're going to stop praying, right? So this was just an exercise for us to boost our prayer and to get back to the habit of doing some of these things that we should be doing anyway. The thing is, anything that you're supposed to do on a regular basis, anything we should do on an ongoing basis, we need to enjoy it or at some point we're just going to quit and give up right? If you can't find a way to enjoy working out, you're just not going to do it. You're going to be like, yeah, I'm going on a diet, and I'm going to work out, and I'm going to pump iron, and you do it that one day, and then the next day, you're like, oh, I'm sore, and then the day after that, you're like, oh, I think I'm maybe still kind of sore, and the next day, you forget that you ever started lifting weights anyway, and then, you know, a month later, your wife's like, why do you have a weight set in the basement? You're like, because I'm going to lift weights, and so then maybe you do it like one more time, and then Facebook Marketplace, weight set for sale, you know, because you never learn to enjoy it. You know, for me, with sports, it was like anything with a ball, I'm good. Like, I couldn't understand track people. Like, why do you run to get in shape to run? Like, I don't get this. Like, if I'm running so that I can be better at soccer, so I can outrun the other guy or have the stamina to, to play defense or to score or whatever, or, or on the basketball court that I can keep running up and down the court and playing defense and all that kind of stuff, that I get. Like, give me a focus. I can enjoy that, right? So I would keep at it. But like, forget it, like running, like, you're just going to get me to do, no. <laughs> and that's sadly, that's some people's attitude towards prayer. Like, yeah, pastor said I'm going to have to pray. And so I really hate this, but I'm just going to do it because he said to. And now he's saying I have to keep doing it. And so I'm going to have to like try to do this. But the problem is if we never learn to enjoy praying, then eventually we're just going to hang it up, Right? And it's interesting because David indicated that you can enjoy the things of God. Did you know that? You can actually enjoy the things of God. In Psalm chapter 1, starting in verse 1, he said, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. So in other words, somebody has not just like started reading the Bible and are like, I don't get this, like this is really old, and this makes no sense to me, and then I'm just going to leave it over here. Somehow they had got to the point where they understood like how to read the word and how to understand what God was saying to them. And it started to, to make a difference in their life to the point where day and night, they're thinking about the word of God. They're thinking about what God said and how do I apply this to my life? And isn't that awesome that God loves me and that I'm accepted by him and that I've been made right with him through the blood of Jesus. I don't have to be afraid to go to God. Isn't that cool? And they started to enjoy the word. 
And then it says, verse 3, they're like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season. Their leaves do not wither, and they prosper in all they do. So the moral of the story is, if we're going to prosper in our praying, if we're going to live a life where we, we can enjoy spending time with God and where uh, our prayer life is going to bear fruit, then we're, at some point we're going to have to learn to enjoy it. Problem is, anything you try for the first time is hard, right? You try something, it feels awkward, it's embarrassing, and you just want to give up. For most of us as adults, we have got to the point in life where if we don't like something, there's not really many people who are going to force us to learn something new. So we have stopped learning new things, and we just do things that we already know how to do. That is called being old. <laughs> All right? When you have stopped learning, stopped growing, stopped progressing, stopped trying new things, stopped taking risks, you are old whether you have gray hair or don't have gray hair whether you're 23 or 73, because I know some really young 73-year-olds. Anyway, that's not the point. But we can learn to enjoy prayer. And I know it was like this in my own life. You know, I grew up in church, and, and uh, you know, when I was 16, I decided, you know what, I'm going to serve God with everything I have. And a year later, he called me into the ministry. And then a year later, I moved to go to Bible school. And I can tell you, at that time, I was not a prayer warrior. Like, the longest I'd prayed, like, at one point was probably, like, two minutes, all right? So I uh, went off to Bible school, and when I got to Bible school, my roommate was a guy from Dallas, Texas named Dwayne Munoz, and he was almost as tall as me and really suave-looking uh, Mexican-American guy, and, and uh, he was 21, and I was 18. He'd already completed a year of Bible school, and, you know, my younger brother was three years younger than me. He was three years older than me, so it just then kind of clicked in my head. This is like he became kind of like an older brother figure. And so in the process of time as we're getting ready to start the school year, Dwayne told me, you have to go to prayer school. Like, it's really important that you go to prayer school to maximize your experience here. And I'm like, okay, Dwayne says it, I'm doing it. Like, that must be important because he knows. He's been down this road. So I committed to go to prayer school every day. And prayer school was every day at 1 o'clock every weekday after school. So go home, eat lunch, and then go back at 1 o'clock for prayer school. It's like from 1 to 2, 2.15. And during those first couple weeks, they would take time and did a lot of teaching on prayer. What prayer is, how to pray, all the basics of prayer, what we can pray about. You know, the you know, first step of prayer is praising the Lord. And, and then that first day, you know, they gave us five minutes at the end to pray. It was like, all right. They were telling us how to pray, we're going to pray. And so I started praying, and again, after like two minutes, it was like, I think I just said everything to God that I know to say, now what? And it really stretched me, like, now what do I say to God? Like I said, like, God, you're good, and God, you're big, and God, I love you, and thanks for saving me, and um, yeah, now what? But it stretched me to think, like, okay, well, who is God, and who is he in my life, and what else has he done for me? And really to think about it and start to cultivate my understanding of my relationship with God. You know, it's like when you, when you first start talking to girls, you know, I have this cootie theory, all right? You grow up, you're little, and everybody tells you there's cooties, you have cootie spray, the whole thing, then you get mature and you realize there are no cooties, then you hit puberty and you realize there are cooties and you like it, <laughs> right? Cooties are a good thing. So anyway, but then you try to talk to girls and it's like, uh, let's see, I'm not into Barbies or unicorns or flowers, what do I say, right? I'm into trucks and dirt and things that blow up. Like, it doesn't go with Barbies. Like, I hurt my sister's Barbies when I was little, and she didn't really like it. So I don't know how to talk to girls. But after a while, you know, someday, eventually you find that girl that you can just talk to. And then you talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, and you can talk like all night long to this girl, and it's like, where did this come from? You know, and it's kind of the same way, you know, in my life with God that we started that first week of prayer school, and it was like, I don't know what to say to God. Like, he's God, and like, I'm not God. Like, he already knows everything that I would say anyway, so why do I tell him this stuff, right? But we would go along, and that first week, it was like five minutes. Like, how in the world did we drag through this five minutes? And then a couple weeks later, it was more like 10 minutes, and then 15 minutes, and 20 minutes. And by the end of the school year, you know, they would come in, and whoever was leading that day would be like, okay, we, we'd sing one song. They'd give us a scripture and tell us, hey, we're going to pray for Europe today, and da-da-da-da, and give us about three sentences, go. And then hundreds of us who were there for prayer school that day would tear into it, and we'd pray for 45 minutes or an hour, and it was, it was amazing the time 
time would just fly by, and it was like, man, he just learned to just interact with God and what he was doing and just get into his presence. And so many times I remember at the end of prayer school, just like the, God met us in such a powerful way that I just I didn't want to look at anybody in the eye on my way out the door. Like I just walk out, just kind of keep my head down, like find where the door was, get out, you know, hit the street, walking over to my apartment. And I'd just be like walking like really gently, like not wanting to make noise, not wanting to disturb anything because I had this tangible presence of God that I was carrying with me and I didn't want it to fly away. You know, I wanted to maintain this, this sense of God is here, he's with me, he's in me, we're communicating, and really that's where that grew out of, is just learning to have that lifestyle. And I can't tell you that I spend like hours in prayer every day or anything, but what I've learned is that, you know what, I enjoy praying, I enjoy talking to the Lord, I enjoy his presence, so I've learned, hey, it's become a lifestyle for me. You know, morning, night, middle of the day, whatever, there's different times throughout the day where I'm just talking to God and just praising him and just telling him thank you and asking him about stuff and just communicating with him, you know, the same way that I should do, you know, with my wife on a regular basis, and hopefully we, we do that well, and I'm a really good listener in Jesus' name. But <laughs> the goal is not to look like, you know, or put on a show for other people that we're praying. The goal is to really develop that relationship with God where we're learning to talk with him and we're learning to pray. And the thing is, when, when we start into something like it was for me, it's not easy. It's, it, it's tricky. It, it's hard. And that can make us want to just hang it up, right? You know, when I was 12 years old, I had asked mom and dad. They were getting ready to go to the Philippines, and I don't know why I did this, but I asked them to bring me a guitar. And the weird thing is, they did. And now that I've flown, I understand that's not the easiest thing to bring a guitar on an airplane, but they brought back a guitar, in this case, on an airplane, full-size acoustic guitar. And so I was all excited about it, you know, 12 years old. I've seen, you know, people like wailing on the guitar and stuff, and I'm like, yeah, that's going to be me. And so I got this book to learn to play guitar, and I get the thing out, and I tune it up, and I sit down, and I'm like, ow, this hurts. You know, your hands don't want the, you know, it says put your thumb here and your hands like over here and you're like, nah, my fingers don't work that way. You know, they don't want to go that way and my, my poor little virgin fingertips were, were soft and supple and pushing down on these steel wires, you know, was cutting into my flesh and it hurt. And so, you know, I'm trying and I realize after like 20 minutes, uh, I'm not shredding here, dude. This is hard. So I put the guitar back in its case and like, it was just kind of sat there, and about you know, every year or so, I'd be like, you know what? I have a guitar. I'm going to learn to play the guitar. And I'd get out that guitar, and then I'd put my fingers on those steel strings again, and I'd start to learn to play the guitar for 10 minutes and be like, ow, this is frustrating. This is irritating. This is impossible. I'm not doing this, and I'd put it away. Until I was 20 years old and I went to Bible school and, and played basketball for a good coach who taught us about setting goals and about, you know, training to do things. And one day in practice, he saw me do this little hook shot and he says, do you think you could master that? And I'm like, well, sure, why not? So he's like, all right, here's what I want you to do. And he had me like come into the gym and, and I would just sit there catching the ball, turning and doing this baby hook like a hundred times from one side and a hundred times from the other side. But you know what? Eventually it got to the point where in the game, somebody sends me the ball in the post and I could turn and, and drop this hook shot without even looking at the hoop over guys and it would just fall and it was like automatic. So I learned, okay, anything worth doing is worth investing the effort, but you have to attack it a little bit at a time. So what I did, I was 20 years old and, and was helping lead worship in the youth group where I was leading here at the church. And, and uh, I'm like, man, you know, I've always wanted to play guitar. There's no reason not to learn. So I said, you know what? I set a goal that, you know, I want to play one song with the youth band by the end of the, the by Christmas. And this was like in September. So I'm like, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take 20 minutes every day after lunch and just practice guitar. So that's what I did. I'd eat my lunch, look at the clock. 20 minutes, go. And I get the guitar out, same thing. I put my finger right here. I'm going to put this, this finger in this. You. I really would get mad at my hands. But eventually I figured out, okay, how to put them where they needed to go. And it was frustrating. Those first couple days were ridiculously hard. And, but every day I recognized it was going a little, getting a little better and a little better. And what would happen was each day when I'd started that 20 minutes, I'd realize I'd backed up just a little bit. And then about five, ten minutes into it, I'd catch up to where I was the day before. And for the next ten minutes, I'd begin to make progress. I could go a little further than I had. Like, it wasn't, I wasn't awesome overnight, all right? 
So by Christmas, I could play three chords well enough that I played a song with three chords with the youth band. It was a really, really slow chord song with not very many chord changes. Anybody know, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, <laughs> pure and whole. You know, it went slow, but it went, you know, and then as time went on and I got better, then I started to enjoy it and, and it just became a passion of mine, you know, and I'd even go to the guitar store and I'd try out this guitar and I'd try out that guitar and I'd try out that guitar. I could spend hours trying different guitars and just playing guitar because it was so fun and they sound different and they sound good and I'd spend time, you know, worshiping the Lord with my guitar and it was just became this huge hunger to spend time with God worshiping him with my guitar. But it didn't start out with, wow, I really love guitar and I can't get enough of it. It started out as, you know what, I want to do this, I need to do this, I'm going to set a goal and I'm going to make this happen. And it's the same thing that needs to happen with us in our prayer lives. But so often I think we expect any time that God calls us to do something, we expect to like, I'm going to try it one day and I'm going to be awesome at it the next. Like, bam, let's get this done, Right? I mean, we live in an industrialized age. You know, in the last century, they invented the, uh, the assembly line, you know, and in Detroit, you know, they're cranking out cars in like a day. Like, you have nuts and bolts and a pile of metal. A day later, you've got a whole car. Like, wow, that's amazing. But you know what? In nature, things are not produced. They're not built. In nature, things grow. And so we have to give ourselves room to grow, which means we have to be content to start small and realize that God is cool with us starting small, right? You know, as we started this and we said to commit to, you know, praying some each day, it wasn't a matter of, hey, everybody should pray two hours, no matter who you are, no matter how long you've known the Lord, put down on that sheet, you're going to pray two hours, we're going to call you every day and make sure that you have. That's not what happened. We said, hey, think about it, make a decision for yourself, because everybody's at a different place, right? In Mark chapter 4, Jesus said, starting in verse 26, he said, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, but he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crops on its own. First, a leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of wheat are formed, and finally the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle, for the harvest has come. So he said, it's first the blade. You know, that little blade pops up. If you ever planted a garden, you know, you see these little green things starting to stick up, you know, through there. And you don't know if they're weeds. You don't know if it's the seed that you planted. You just have to be patient, keep watering, keep waiting. Eventually, you're like, oh, these are weeds. These are actually look like what I wanted. And you pluck up the weeds and you keep going. And it takes all summer and you wait for it. And finally, you have tomatoes or peppers or corn or zucchini or whatever it is you planted. But it takes time. And it's the same way in our walk with God. We don't just pop, turn into professional, you know, Christians overnight or prayer warriors. It takes time. And it takes a concentrated effort to start small and just let the Lord lead us and guide us and, and allow ourselves to grow in that as time goes by. In Zechariah chapter 4, uh, it says this way, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. And here he was talking about when, when they were going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. But notice it says that he is excited to see the work begin. God is not just excited when it's done. God's not just excited when you become, you know, the best prayer in your family. God is excited when you say, you know what, Lord, I know that I need to learn to pray. And you know what, I'm going to take two minutes and I'm going to start learning to pray right now. Amen? Give yourself some grace because God gives you grace to do the same thing. And as we do that, just like with me and my guitar playing, if you'll start small and just allow it to continue to build and you just be persistent, again, he, Jesus taught his disciples to do what? To pray and to never give up, right? There's going to be times you want to give up because anything that's spiritual, the enemy's going to fight you on, so it's not going to magically like be easy, like poof, like, oh, prayer is the most fun thing ever. Like prayer is more fun than playing basketball or than watching TV and prayer is more fun than eating. And so I'm just going to pray all the time. You know, it, that doesn't usually happen. All right. It's a spiritual discipline. So it's something that we learn to get good at. We learn to enjoy the fruit of, but you know what, even as a pastor, right? 
a pastor in Germany for 10 years, and we would hold prayer meetings, and a lot of those I led, and, you know, I should want to go to the prayer meeting that I'm leading myself, right, that I'm encouraging all the people in my church to attend, and I'm thinking there's Tuesday afternoon, we've got prayer tonight, I'm thinking all the work I, you know, I had to do today, and I'm just really whooped, and it would be nice just to sit on my butt, you know, home on the couch, and, and chill with my family, and, but we have prayer meeting at 7 o'clock, so, all right, here we go, we're going to go to prayer, and, and it was cool because every time, you know, it was like, I had to overcome myself to go, you know? But every time God would meet us and leave, and it was always like, man, I'm so glad we have prayer tonight. That was awesome. You know, God would speak things to us and direct things, and there's so much power that comes through prayer, but you're never going to get to the point where the enemy's going to quit fighting you about it because the enemy knows how much power is in prayer. In James chapter 5, starting in verse 13, it says, are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you've committed any sins, you'll be forgiven. Verse 16 says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. It goes on and it says Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. So Elijah was not some kind of superman. He was a, a person just like you and me. God heard his prayer and amazing thing happened. things happened. And things happen when we pray. The problem is we just can't usually see them with our eyeballs, right? And so sometimes it's like, well, I prayed. Like, what's happening? Well, the angels are, are ministering. The Holy Spirit started to work the moment that you started to pray. Just be patient. Trust the Lord, and you'll see the fruits of your prayer. Amen? Because it says here that the prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. That's why Satan hates prayer so much. That's why he fights you about praying and tries to come up with all kinds of distractions and excuses. Why not to pray? Is because he knows if you pray, he's getting a whooping. He knows that if you pray, your life is going to be changed. The lives of your family members are going to be changed. The lives in your community and in our world are going to change if the church of the living God prays. Amen. Amen. And I don't care who you are or how much experience you have in prayer. Your prayers produce fruit. What he was saying here when he said Elijah was as human as we are, is he's saying Elijah was no better than you or me. God doesn't have favorites. God doesn't say, well, I like Pastor, and I like Sean, and maybe Nick, but I don't know if I like Joe. I don't know if I like Morgan so much. You know, Karen, you know, she's practically a saint, so she ranks pretty high up there. But then there's Dennis Rima back there, and, and we definitely wonder about him sometimes. You know, that's not the way God is. God's like, I love Dennis. I love Karen. I love Morgan. I love, I love all of you the same. You're all my kids, Right? You know, I remember when, when my first daughter was born, I was so moved, I was so emotional. Like, I remember that, uh, you know, Kirsten's parents, my parents are both sitting here this morning, and, and we have a video of them outside of the hospital room waiting for us to come tell them if it was a boy or a girl. And they're like, why aren't they coming out yet? Why aren't they coming out yet? Well, Gabrielle was throwing a fit. She was going crazy. They couldn't weigh her because she was bouncing around so much. You know, they had to estimate her weight, and I'm just so overwhelmed emotionally. You know, my little artist heart was like, oh, I have a girl. You know, I'm a dad now, and all this responsibility, and just my connection with this little thing that just came out of my wife. I'm like, you know, this is amazing. And like, so then I went out. I didn't want to go out and talk to them because I knew I couldn't handle it, you know. And I come outside, I'm like, <laughs> we have a daughter, you know, and I like break down and melt. You know, and the, here's the deal. God feels that way about you. When you came into his family, he's like, man, I'm so thrilled to have this kid, and I feel so responsible for their lives and to nurture them and to make them know how much I love them, to help them to grow upright and to take care of them. That's how God felt about you, which is why your prayers have such amazing potential. But the enemy tries to tell us, hey, your prayers don't do nothing. Let somebody else pray for you. Let your pastor pray for you. Let the prayer team pray for you. And nothing against the prayer team or letting somebody else pray with you. That's all cool. 
But if you think that their prayers are, are intrinsically better than your prayers, you're wrong. God loves you just as much as he loves anybody else, and you have just as much right to use the name of Jesus as anybody else does. Your prayers can be powerful and effective. Amen. And, you know, one of the things that also happens is the enemy tries to make us men, I'm talking about the males in the room, think that prayer is something that ladies do. But we read earlier that Jesus told a story to his disciples, teaching them that they should always pray and never give up. Peter, James, John, Matthew, all 12 of these guys are male. Jesus had lots of followers, supporters, people around him who were women. We have, you know, his mom and Mary Magdalene and, you know, all these other people. But those 12 guys that Jesus raised up to change the world who he taught how to pray were men. And it's a lie of the enemy that prayer is a woman's job. Men, we need to rise up. And I understand we don't like talking as much as our wives do normally. Right? I mean, they say that the word count of a woman that she speaks on an average day is double that of the average man. I understand that. Now, I understand there are also men that talk a lot. I mean, we had one guy at one of our pastor's meetings who his wife, he, he said this. He said his wife will often tell people, don't put a quarter in that guy. Because <laughs> he just can't stop talking. You know, so there are men that like to talk. But in general, men are doers, not so much talkers. We're not so much verbal, Right? Right? I heard a couple grunts. Those were the men. <laughs> but God did not give us an out. He didn't say, all right, uh, you disciples, I'm going to teach you to pray. Then when the church starts, you teach all the women and just let the women take it from here. Like, that's not a thing. That's not a biblical doctrine of women's prayer something. I don't know. Right? God has called us as men to rise up and to be men of God, which includes being men of prayer. Now, the way you pray may be a lot different than your wife, and that is perfectly fine. Amen. But God has made us to be leaders in our homes, leaders in our communities. And the problem is if men don't pray, then our kids grow up thinking that faith is for sissies. Because dad doesn't pray, just mom does. Mom wants to go to church all the time. Mom's constantly talking about this God stuff and wanting us to read our Bibles. Dad just goes to work, he comes home, he watches football, he goes back to work, he comes home, he watches football, he eats, he scratches himself, and that's about it, <laughs> right? If that's the vision that they have of manhood, then the next generation's in trouble. It's important that our kids see that we are men who love Jesus that we are men who love God, that we, we are men of his word, and that we are men who pray. And not that we have to play lo pray long, flowery prayers, but that we pray, that we talk to God, that we hear his voice, that we're telling our family, God is dealing with me about this, that we're leading our families in the ways of God. Amen? So let's not make excuses, but let's you know, the same way that we make all these kinds of excuses to avoid things we don't like. Oh, I have to mow the yard. Oh, it's time for dinner. Can't do that right now. What we need to do is we need to flip the script and we need to start using all of these things as excuses to pray, not as excuses to avoid prayer. Here's what I mean. You know, in, in my life, when what I've made a habit of is when I get in the shower, the water comes on. I'm not a morning person. You can ask anybody who knows me. Uh, once I've had my double shot of espresso, I look a lot more like a morning person, but it, it takes some caffeine. When I get in the shower and that water hits me, I've developed a habit of saying, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Not, oh, man, another morning, <laughs> another day, I got to go to work, I got to do this, I got to do that. Uh, right? But it's become something that's become a habit in my life. 
Not an excuse not to pray. It's become an excuse to pray. And use all these little times in your day, these rituals and these things that you do all the time, use them as little punctuation marks that say, oh, here's where I'm supposed to pray. I'm sitting down to eat. I'm going to pray and thank God for my food. You know what? Whether it's at work, whether it's in a restaurant, whether I'm sitting there with my family, I'm going to pray for my food. And let me encourage you, even when you have guests over to your house who don't love Jesus, pray over your food. Tell them, you know what? We pray and we thank the Lord for our food. I encourage you, we're going to bow our heads and quick and pray. You don't have to be like, thou shalt pray with us or thou standest condemned. You get no pizza. You get the leftovers on the pan once we have all eaten because you're a heathen. No, but you pray for your food. Why? Because you love Jesus and because it's the right and normal thing to do. You know, we lived in Germany. We had a kid in our town who had a really rough family background. He was having troubles in school, and, and he came from a, a, a Muslim family, and, and he would come over and play with Smith a lot, and he would just be there, just kind of like once he was, Adrian showed up, he was just kind of there indefinitely for the day until we said, you got to go home, <laughs> right? And so several different times he came and was like, okay, we're eating. Put another plate at the table for Adrian. And so he would sit there and, and be like, hey, Adrian, we're going we're gonna to pray. And so you can just close your eyes for a second and we're just, you know, we prayed over our food. No big grand prayer. No God save Adrian and show him the error of his ways. It was just, hey, thank you, Father, for our food. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we just pray for our food. And he'd come a couple times. So about the fourth or fifth time that he was at our house for dinner, we went to sit down for dinner, and he sat down first. And as soon as we were just, just, we weren't even all sat down yet. We were almost all sat down. Adrian's like, hey, it's time to pray, right? Like, he was excited to pray with us over dinner. Like, this is a thing. This is a thing you do. And, and I know this because I've been here before, and I understand that it's prayer time. So let's pray over, you know. It was like, okay, wow. You know, you don't understand the impact of just you being a normal Christian can have on other people around you. Like, oh, wow. These people are not hypocrites. They actually pray over their food. Like, they actually believe this stuff. It's not just on Sunday morning when they go to church or when they need to make a show for somebody else, but they're actually living for God. Like, wow, amazing. You know, before you get ready to go to work, you know, you have your car ride, 5, 10, however long your car ride is. You know, it's an opportunity to talk to God about what's going on in your life and begin to praise Him and thank Him for the day. You know, we, we make, it, make it a point to pray with our kids every day before they go to school and thank God that He gives them wisdom and understanding and that He gives them favor and He protects them as they drive down the road at 16, you know, and, and that God makes us all salt and light in our day. You know, we pray with our kids before they go to bed. When they were little, we made sure that we get us, we get us all in the car, and we'd pray on the way to church. And every day, we'd be praying, thank God we're going to have a great service, and God's going to speak to us today and give pastor, you know, something to say to us. And we have a great time in worship, and the older the kids got, the, we started to get them involved, and we started having them taking turns in the back seat. Who prayed last week? Gabrielle did. Okay. Marissa, it's your turn to pray. Oh, I don't want to pray this week. Well, it's your turn. All right. So then Marissa would pray, and they started taking up the pattern of prayer that we had because they learned it. And now they do the same thing. It's funny, you know, I hear our kids lead prayer. They pray like we prayed in the car like all those years ago. But they learned it through those things and just use those, those times and those moments as, hey, now's a good time to talk to God. Now's a good time to talk to God. You just develop a rhythm and, a, and an ability to talk to him. Amen? So again, the point is, it's not about, you know, praying an hour and about praying like your neighbor, praying about like somebody else. It's, it's about developing that relationship with God and starting right where you are and growing from there. Amen? So today is not the end of prayer, although it's the end of the 21 days of prayer. Today is the, just the beginning of the next phase of your life with God. Amen? So however the Lord's dealing with you this morning, just make that little decision, okay, God, I'm going to engage, and you probably have had some ideas or some things I've said this morning and thought, oh, that's a good idea. I should try that. So just make a decision today. You know what? I'm going to do that. Father, I'm not the greatest prayer, and, and, and I don't pray like so-and-so, you know, and I can't pray for an hour, but you know what? I'm going to pray for three minutes. I'm going to sit down with my Bible, and when I get done reading my Bible, I'm going to talk to you about what I read, you know, whatever the case may be. And you know, if you're in here this morning and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you know, you may have went to church hundred different times, grandma made you go, whatever the case may be, going to church doesn't make you a child of God. Right? You know, going to the mall does not make you clothing, going to the, you know, 
The movie theater does not make you popcorn. Going, going to the church does not make you a child of God. What makes you a child of God is believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And with your mouth telling Jesus, Jesus, you're my Lord. It's through prayer. Not a big, long, flowery one. Just being direct and honest with him. Making a decision and praying. And I'd like to ask that we all bow our heads this morning just to give privacy to that person next to you. If you're in here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never made him the Lord of your life, I'm just going to lead all of us in a prayer this morning so that you have an opportunity to do that. So church, let's pray together. God, I come to you. I thank you for sending Jesus, that he died on that cross, and that you raised him from the dead. Jesus, I give you my life today. Be my Lord and Savior. I will follow you. Thank you for receiving me and accepting me, and that I am now a child of God. In Jesus' name.